as Brendan was mentioning in the chat, please tell us know who you are, where you're from. Uh, today's going to be a little bit special. We usually have a live interview and a Q and A. It's going to be a bit different today because we're going to be talking about facilitation today. So, a little bit of a different experience for you guys today. Um, so, very quickly, I want to say again, uh, thank you to our sponsors for the past couple of years. Slatham has been very uh, helpful, as well as Precocity, who is helping us with these Zoom meetings. Um, quickly, today is uh, the, 20th, the 19th. Uh, I am Greg Lacluffy of Slatham and Brandon uh, of Precocity, uh, Christopher Robin from Capital One, and Brenda from GM Financial. We are basically um, the Savvy Design Network Dallas chapter, and we are providing you guys with um, access to service design knowledge, expertise, experience, and case studies. Um, as always, all the events are recorded, this one as well. So if you want to go to YouTube and look for Service Design Network, the last chapter, you will see the last three sessions um, that you can view. We have hundreds of views already. So if some of you guys who are you know, in Asia, for example, and cannot see it live, you can always catch up and see it on YouTube. We have had the uh, privilege to have Mark a couple of weeks ago. Today we have Adam St. John Lawrence, who's going to talk to us about facilitation. Quick update, we're going to have Jim Kalbach on June 2nd talking about mapping experiences. And then we'll have Andy Pauline on June 25th talking about uh, the business of service design as a whole. And those are going to be just the classical interview, uh, live Q&A kind of uh, uh, sessions. Also, I wanted to add that we have more topical sessions. Um, we're going to have Mark Fontaine's going to come back. We had a very, very successful and very fruitful uh, service design education um, session a few weeks ago, and people have had so many questions. We had decided to actually bring Mark back to talk mostly about service design portfolio, how to build it, uh, how to include uh, PCs in it, and how to manage your service design career, and how to look for jobs, and so on and so forth. So Mark will be back with us on June the 9th. Uh, we have also um, added a new session on the 16th. Uh, as my friend Robin says, we need to always navigate the academic part of service design and the practical part. So we will have Christine Patterson from Alto, which is a ride-hailing uh, company here in Dallas, um, and Garcia, who is in San Francisco. And they're both going to tell us about how they had uh, service design helped them through a very difficult time. And this particular is going to be very much about COVID-19 and how they were able to get through it successfully and come out stronger hopefully so do not miss that it's going to be very practical very much about what they did how they did it and why they did it you can ask them questions so it's going to be super cool to have people talk about very practical stuff on the 16th and then we have a lot of questions about innovation and startups so we'll have jesse grimes uh, i believe is in berlin germany and he's the editor-in-chief of the touchpoint magazine which is a service and network uh, official magazine and on the 30th, he will tell us more about service design and innovation, uh, most likely in the uh, startup space, um, which is also incredibly um, uh, difficult space to actually have service design in, in something that doesn't exist yet. So definitely tune in for that. Um, today, we're going to do something special. We're going to have virtual break room. So all of you right now will be assigned to a break room. Uh, this is new. We had never done this before. So you're going to be uh, probably four of you will be in a breakout room and you will be asked to do a particular exercise. Um, and so we'll see exactly how that works out. We have, um, it's going to be automatic. So we'll see how it works out in terms of uh, splitting the rooms. But that's going to be kind of new for you guys to experience if you've been following us for the past several weeks. Today we have uh, Adam St. John Lawrence is going to tell us about the, uh, the dark art of facilitation. And, and it is, I, I kind of joke about it. I, I met Adam a couple of years ago and he's, he's a master facilitator. You know, he has, and I wish we could do this in, in person because he has, he has great charisma, charisma and, and persona and it is really, it's really a lot of fun to be around. Um, but facilitation is very much uh, an art. It's a science as well, but it's an art as well. And not to actually have uh, the research background, the ideation background, but facilitating is just this really squishy thing that it's just really hard, you know, putting somebody in a room full of a bunch of people and make them feel safe. They can express themselves is something that is just not easy. And, and Adam is going to try to explain us or show us some tips and tricks how he can do that. Um, I think uh, if um, today's agenda is no agenda, we're going to try to do like freestyling this. Um, I think the one question I would have that Mark had delegated to you, Adam, is um, in terms of workshopping and, and user interviews, how do you foster a safe space? That would be the, the, the kickoff 
question to you. How do you foster an environment actually create a safe space for either the designers and the uh, people being interviewed or the stakeholders? Thanks, Greg. That's really, uh, thanks for that question. Mark also gave me a hint that he was going to uh, charge me with that one. So I built part of my little session around that. So the later part of our session, we're going to take that as an example um, of some of the things I'm talking about in the early part of my session. Yeah. Um, so thanks very much for having me here. Uh, it's very remarkable what you guys at SDN Dallas have put together. Um, I think you were the really smart ones who, when COVID started coming, you thought, okay, well, how can we yes and this? How can we make a, make a, something positive out of this? And you got in contact, reached out to your networks really quickly um, and asked a bunch of, I think, super interesting people. Um, those are the ones I know are certainly fascinating uh, to come in and join you in this, uh, in your local context and in the global context. I see people here from all over the world clicking in and that's fantastic. Um, some of you guys have met before, that's brilliant. Uh, if I've not met you before, I'm very pleased to do so. Um, before we get into this and before I start sharing my screen and start giving you guys a, a short little presentation and activities session, uh, after that we can go really free form, we can take questions, we can do more breakouts, whatever you want to do. Um, I'd just like to uh, say a little bit about how I'm approaching today. Yeah, I'm approaching today it is very much and a motto of freedom within structure. Yeah, so I've got some ideas, some anchor points set of how I want to do this. And I've also got a lot of freedom built in and a lot of options. And I hope you guys will work with me and with the team here while we figure some things out and we say, let's try that, let's try that. Because by trying things is the only way uh, that we move forward in design. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to do a thing, a good old Zoom chat question, first of all. You've already put in there, where you are from. Um, but I'd like you to chip into the, into the Zoom chat now really quickly. What is the context of your facilitation? Are you in service design projects? Are you trainers? Are you, um, are you a, a network system manager who has to facilitate the people in your, in your company? Where are you helping people? Just type that in there. What do you think? I'm seeing sales coming in, service design, professional development. Go on in there and just type that in. Of course, I won't read them all out, it's way too many, but you can look in yourself and get a rough idea of what's happening. Change, planning, service design, biotech, really interesting. Uh, UX, lots of service design, I guess that's, the, that's also the, uh, the bias of this community. That's fantastic, it's, it's what's on the label. Interaction design, lean, great, great. So I'm gonna keep looking at that with one eye as we go on. Some students in there as well, hello students, and good luck with the studies. Um, Facilitation for me is whenever we are helping someone to move forward. Yeah? And our role there is to facilitate, to make things easier for them. And what that means is what I want to talk to you guys about today. Yeah? I'd also like to come into the two sides of that because Greg talked about the dark side of uh, facilitation. I think one of the most important things the facilitator also does is difficultation. You know, to make things more difficult and to challenge people when they're making it too easy for themselves. So we'll be talking about that flip-flop between facilitation and difficultation, from facile to make easy or difficile to make more difficult. Yeah. And I'm gonna show my screen with you now. Let's hope this works out. Um, I had a screen sharing issue before, so uh, nothing could go wrong except what can go wrong. And I'm gonna start sharing this keynote presentation and I will start that presentation as soon as I find my cursor again. And if you've got your camera on and give me a thumbs up, I know you can see this. So okay. Brandon, can you see this? Great, fantastic. Yep, fantastic. yep we're good. Okay. So um, Workplay Experience, name of my company. Don't, that's not important, don't worry about that too much, but it kind of shows you where we are in the world. We are trying to help people work better. We are quite playful and experiential in the way we do that. And often our work is focused on also experiences and what kind of ones people have. Um, let's go. I'm gonna do this kind of presentation a little bit on two levels. Yeah, I'm gonna talk to you guys as if I were presenting to you, but also as if I were a colleague telling you what's happening behind the scenes, yeah? Because this is part, the next section here is part of a keynote I often give in large organizations to help them get on the road towards working differently. Um, and this is the first question I normally ask them. I'm gonna ask it of you guys as well. 
If you know the answer, just sit back and relax. But if you've not heard it before, please do play along. So this is data from a real study in a real airport. Yeah? It was a German airport, and it was about 10 years ago. And in that airport, about 10 years ago, they knew that older travelers, I don't know what older travelers mean, but I turned 50 two years ago, and my Facebook advertising changed overnight. It went from adventure holidays um, and partnership sites to caravans, which is what you like, we call trailers in the UK, and urinary products. You know, overnight it was all about continents, yeah? So I think probably this means 50 plus. So at this airport, we know that older travelers use the bathroom facilities three times more often than younger travelers. Okay, that's the data we have. Now, if you work for this airport in one of the careers that we're seeing here, yeah, we might, you might ask yourself the question, how might we improve the airport experience for the older travelers? So we know they're using the bathrooms more often. How can we improve their experience? If you've got an idea, just go ahead and type it in the window. And I'll give you guys 20 seconds to do that. And you've got five seconds more. And five, four, three, two, one, and fantastic. No pressure, stick it in there, that's great. So if you look back over the last part of the chat that you can see, you need a big chat window with so many people, yeah? There's lots of stuff here about accessibility, that's really cool, so make wider stalls, for example, handles, about better signage so you can find things, about more restrooms, so adding restrooms or putting them in the right places. And these are all fantastic ideas. And I believe every single one of these ideas would lead to a better experience for people using the restroom. But, yeah, they've all got some costs associated. Adding restrooms to a working airport would be incredibly disruptive and expensive. Yeah? Changing the stalls, same problem. If you, check, you move the walls, you have to actually move them, the, the waste pipes as well. It gets very, very disruptive, very noisy, very expensive, very stinky in a running airport. Even adding signage, the more signs you put in an airport, the more people miss their planes. We know this, yeah? So there's a cost there, an attention cost for that. So all of these are great ideas, which are probably quite expensive in whatever, whatever way, in terms of money or in terms of attention. But what we did here was a classic mistake which organizations always make. We assumed we understood the problem. And I led you towards that a little bit. I made a quick joke about turning 50 and urinary problems and continence products and so on, yeah? And you all started on that path of assuming older people, they're struggling physically, they need to have easier time using the bathroom, which is great. That's certainly true. But we don't know why these guys are actually going into the bathroom. Now, that's a really interesting question because we assume they're going to have a pee, whatever, yeah? But is that really true? And how can we find out? Because we can't put up cameras in the bathrooms. That would be illegal and creepy. Yeah? Uh, we can't go and ask people when they e exit the bathroom, excuse me, what were you doing in there? Yeah? That's, that's not going to fly. That's too creepy as well. So what the guys did in this context was they used a research technique called non-participant observation. Yeah? Basically, they've washed their hands for a really long time. And while they wash their hands for hours and hours, which is very bad for your skin, you use moisturizer, yeah, they saw what was happening in the bathrooms. And most of these older people who were entering the bathrooms were not actually even going into the stalls or using the urinals. They were coming into the bathroom because in the bathroom, they could hear the flight announcements better. It had nothing to do with the actual use of the bathroom. But in there, because of the smaller space, because there was less noise background, yeah, when you get older, your auditory acuity does decrease. They could hear the announcements better. So we would have done the classic thing. We would have had great solutions to the wrong problem. And I'd like you guys to park that thought for a moment. 
I didn't introduce myself yet. My name's Adam, uh, Adam Lawrence. You can find me really easily online at this company, at this Twitter address in the right hand side, left hand side of every slide, by the way, um, or at Service Design DE. I have the great privilege to work with some amazing organizations all around the world, um, many of them in energy, in telcos, or in government, but many others as well, for example, in automotive or in professional services. Uh, and I have the honor to teach service design at some great schools. One of them is the IE Business and School in Madrid, which is the world's best business school that you've never heard of unless you speak Spanish. And I'm also happy to be one of the four co-authors of this book, This is Service Design Doing, which is now available in four languages with the fifth one coming up really soon. Buy the book, feed my children. Don't worry, I have no children. Um, and if you Google me, you'll probably find this event, the Global Service Jam. Um, if, you're a, if you're a jammer, right, yes, in the, uh, in the chat right now, if you've come to this through jamming. So this is the world's biggest um, global service innovation event it takes place on one weekend all around the world look at all those jammers fantastic well thank you all for jamming that's really really exciting uh, where people come together physically and these days also digitally in locations all around the world they have a shared challenge they have 48 hours to research ideate prototype test and publish brand new services and after 48 hours in all these cities all around the world and more we have about six seven hundred brand new prototypes but it's not about the prototypes it's about how people change how they grow how they develop how they learn to facilitate and to collaborate in this context by the way if you want to jam the next global jam is coming up and it's on the weekend of the 8th of august 2020 that's the 8th of the 8th it's very easy to remember lucky number eight okay and if you talk to people about all this work that i do yeah and my background by the way is in psychology and in theater and in comedy and in music i'm a dancer i'm a singer i'm a stripper i'm an actor i'm a comedian if you look at me in all these contexts, what people often say about me is, this man is a fool. And I would like to embrace that. Yeah? Now, what do I mean by fool here? I don't necessarily mean someone who, does, who is an idiot. I'm often an idiot. Yeah? I often do stupid things. I don't mean somebody who is very, very playful and silly, because I, I am playful and silly all the time, but some of the time, but not all of the time. I'm thinking about the fool in the historical sense of the word. Yeah? And if you go back and you look at medieval Europe especially, but you'll find similar things in many places around the world, you'll find the fool as a role within the power structure. So for example, in the, in the emperor's court or in the king's court, there may be a fool. This is a person who cracks jokes, yeah? But that's not all they do. The fool, in the emperor's court or in the king's court or the queen's court is the only person in the court who can say the truth. And they're the only person in the court who can say the truth for two reasons. And one reason is because they can pack it in humor and wit, they make the truth digestible. And the second reason is because they are probably from a very non-privileged background or because they have extreme physical challenges, they are never going to be part of the power structure themselves. The fool is never going to become king. So unlike everybody else around him who might have that aspiration, he can afford to say the truth. I'm saying he because nearly all the records of historical fools have been male, have been men, sorry. Now, here's a great quote from one of the non-historical fools you might have heard of. This is Touchstone from uh, Shakespeare's As You Like It. And he says, the fool to think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. I'm not playing any wisdom for myself, but I think as designers, this is a very, very important thing to understand. To understand that to do good design, it is wise to be the fool. And let's pick apart what that actually means in the next 10 minutes or so. I'm calling this Be a Wise Fool, and I've taken one of the most famous fools in our culture for that, which is the Joker from Playing Cards. And I'll tell you a little later on why I've chosen that particular image. But let's come to our planned breakout session. Maybe some more unplanned ones later on. And I want to tell you what's going to happen here. Yeah? What I'm going to do 
is we're going to put you into small groups. And I think Brandon is setting them up. I'll give you a signal, Brandon, when it's time to send them out. Yeah. And in those small groups, you'll find yourself with three or four other people, yeah, approximately. Um, I do recommend you put your cameras on in the breakout rooms, but don't spend too long saying hi, just a quick wave and straight into it. Yeah. And I suggest this game is the sequencing game, so please work in the alphabetical order of your names. So if you are Aaron, you go before Ezekiel. Yeah? And what you're going to do in the order of your name, so if it's for example, Adam and Brandon and Greg playing, it would be Adam, then Brandon, then Greg, then Adam, then Brandon, then Greg. Yeah? We're going to ask you to tell a story together, one word at a time. Now, don't worry if your native language is not English because grammar is not important in this game. All that's important is that the story keeps going. Let me show you how that might work, yeah? So if you can imagine there are three people here, one is shown by the black text, one by the gray text, one by the white text, yeah? The first person might simply say the word once. The second person might say there. And the third person was. A girl who lived in a difficult situation because, and you just keep going around and you let it take you wherever it takes you. Now, I chose two random words earlier. I choose the word toothpaste, toothpaste. And I chose the word anger, anger. Yeah? Now, if you want, your story can contain toothpaste and anger. Now, before I send you into the rooms, you've got a second task to do there. We're interested here in flow. That means when is the story flowing? When is it easy? When is it natural to keep telling the story? And when does it get difficult? So when you're playing this game, I want you to take 17% of your brain, exactly 17%, which is a totally made up number. Yeah? And I would like you to observe yourselves with that 17% of your brain. And ask yourself while you're playing, when does it flow? And what are we doing that makes it flow? And when does it not flow? And what are we doing that makes it not flow? Now remember, you're taking turns, you're going around telling a story. You can also say full stop if you want to. If you can't think of something to say, you can say pass or skip or please, please, not me, whatever you want to do, yeah? But keep that thing flowing around like this. This is quite a short game. We're going to give you about two minutes, yeah? So really quick, hi everybody, and then choose the person to start. I suggest the person who starts is the person with the most beautiful shoes, because it's really amusing watching you on Zoom trying to check each other's shoes out. Yeah. And then simply have fun telling your one word stories that may contain toothpaste and they may contain anger. Brandon, can you send them out into random rooms, please? Have fun, everybody. So, so I had said suddenly. Okay. Uh, suddenly, um, it <laughs> was. A uh, fairy godmother. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, I guess I'm after Christopher now. Something was pretty good. Who was ready to fly. South. Poor. <laughs> People. Who? <laughs> Love. Yep. Yep. Oh, two. What'd you say? Uh, who love to... Oh. Eat. <laughs> Pizza. On... Um, Oops, sorry, Victoria's turn. Yeah, I think this is great. I think we've had a couple of minutes. And I need to, I need to bounce and, and probably close all the rooms. So this is okay. fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you had a little game there, yeah? Um, it was that little one-word story, and I asked you while you were playing that to watch out for what I called flow, yeah? So when did it feel like it was flowing smoothly? And when did it feel like it was 
not flowing smoothly? When was it blocked? So I'd like us together to sort of reflect on that really quickly. I'm going to share my screen again uh, to show you my keynote presentation. And I'm going to start that keynote presentation. So I've got two questions for you guys at the moment. Yeah. And one question is around what actually helped the flow, what made it go smoothly. And the second one is around what blocked the flow. And I want to start on the right hand side with the minus. Yeah. What blocked the flow? So you had 17% of your brain watching what was going on and asking yourself, mm, what, what made it difficult? Yeah. So if you've got an, uh, a thought of what blocked the flow, go ahead and Type that into the Zoom window. We'll see them flying past like a bunch of swallows. Overthinking, understanding, confusion, not paying attention, lots of overthinking, trying really hard, yeah? Needing it to make sense, yeah? Needed to keep the proper order, not knowing who was next, not having clear instructions, mm. needing it to make sense. Okay, okay. That's fine. Yeah, just finish up what you're typing now. We've got plenty of things there. Okay. Wanting a story. Dropping in after the start. Really nice. So let's switch to the other one. Let's switch to the other one. What do you think helped the flow? When did you notice it was going really, really well? So what helped the flow? Humor, someone said. Open-minded, listening. A bit of fashion. Aha. Uh -huh. Having fun. Riffing off each other randomness finding a rhythm not overthinking so obviously the opposite stuff helps of course but what else was there which really helped you out with that one starting again fun humor great i'll give you five more seconds no pressure five four three two one getting handed an opportunity that's a nice one as well supporting each other okay so I've played that game many, many times in many, many contexts in many, many organizations, pretty much all over the world. It's a classic game from applied improvisation um, to show people two different mindsets that they might have. Yeah. And I've got on my next slide, not things you've written today, but the sort of the top, the top eight things that get said when I play this game with groups. So I'm sure you'll recognize some of these things. Yeah. Oops, let me get the right one there. So what seems to help the flow so what seems to stop the flow is when you feel a need to stick to your own idea. Yeah. And you want to tell a story about the elephant and suddenly it's about a koala bear. You go, this doesn't work for koala bears. Koala bears are tiny. They, they can't squash a, a tree, you know, um, thinking a lot, thinking a lot seems to block the flow with it. It's trying to predict the future because we feel the need to do that, but we can't, yeah. At least not beyond one or two steps. Yeah. Trying to be smart or trying to be funny is not actually very helpful in this context, yeah? And needing to follow the rules, okay? So, for example, in that one, many people really struggle to get in the, toothbrush, the toothpaste and the angry. But they were just suggestions. So you could have totally ignored that suggestion and kept playing. But did you feel that was a rule? It's amazing how often organizations will invent rules and we will give ourselves rules that don't really exist. On the plus side, just trying something, yeah? Just having a go, seeing what happens, letting go, listening well, building on each other's ideas, taking what was there and adding to it, giving someone a step up, giving them an easy word to lead on to, an and, yeah, or a big, and they can easily add a thing onto that. So I'd like you to look at this because in a sense, this captures part of our challenge as facilitators. Now, we've got these two things here. We've got the plus side and the minus side. And I'd like you to type in to the chat rule, plus or minus, depending on which of these two sides organizations usually think is important. Which side do organizations usually think is important? Well, I'm not a statistician, but that looks pretty conclusive to me. Yeah. Everyone there is saying most organizations, one example, autumn, yeah, one exception, everyone else is saying that most organizations value the minus and that's fine. Yeah. Some of my clients build power stations. It's really important that they think a lot, that they follow the rules. Yeah. They don't get creative in the middle of building a nuclear, uh, a nuclear cooling system. 
But on the other hand, it seems that the other side of this actually was more helpful to us in a co-creative system. Yeah. Now, what's important to understand here is I'm not saying left is good, right is bad. I am not saying that. I'm saying we need both of these and organizations and teams tend to stick to the right hand side, especially when they're scared. And when you take someone into a design project, into a situation of uncertainty and not knowing what the future will be or not even knowing if it's going to work, people get scared and they tend to stick to the right hand side. So if you like, facilitation is the art of moving between these and knowing when it's appropriate to help people to let go and just try something and listen and build. And when it's appropriate to say, okay, let's come back. Where are we? What's our scope? What's our regulation around this? What's our, what's our technical capabilities going to be like? Yeah? And shifting between these things as you go, because that change, that switch is very difficult for people. Hold that thought. I want to quickly go through what I think the challenges are here and what I call the three main tools that we have to deal with this. The facilitator's challenge, as I see it, is that we as facilitators have the most interesting material in the world. Yeah? Um, you might say that if you're a graphic designer, your material is your pencil or your stylus. Yeah? And if you're a product designer, perhaps your material, well, it used to be modeling materials, so now probably it's, it's a 3D design program, your CAD program. Yeah? But I think one of the most brilliant service designers is Sarah Drummond from Snook in Scotland and London. Uh, and she says, the material of a service designer, and many of you are service designers, the material of a service designer is the organization. That is what you work with. And it's also what you build. Yeah? So we are trying to facilitate human collaboration. And human collaboration has some bugs. It has some very, very serious bugs. Because humans have some bugs. We as a species, I'm sorry, but we're not perfect. Yeah, you might have figured out over your few years on this planet so far, but we have some bugs as a species. And these are three of them, which are incredibly important if you are a designer. <laughs> Gasp, yes, thank you, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> if you are a designer, you need to remember these things because we as designers get them wrong all the time. The first one is we think we see the problem and we don't. Think about the example with the bathrooms in the airport. We all assumed that was an issue of using the toilet facilities, and it wasn't. It was an issue of, of navigation. So we did great work to solve the wrong problem. As facilitators, we are helping people to understand that they don't understand the problems that they have. And that's really, really hard to hear, which is why I often use that bathroom example at the start of my collaborations with any of my audiences. We think our ideas are good, but they're not. Nearly all our ideas are shit. And I'm sorry if that's a bad word, but it's a technical word in design. Yeah, the shitty first draft. Most of our ideas are shit. Even someone, even multimillionaires, Ted Turner, yeah, um, the, the media billionaire, if you ask any of his, any of his team, his closer team, they will say he used to he'd come along to a board meeting and he'd have 20 ideas. And 19 of these ideas were absolute deep stinking shit. And one of them was worth a billion dollars. And Ted had no idea which one was which. And that's somebody who is a successful billionaire. So for most of it, it's more like a thousand to one, I think. And we can't tell who they are because of the third one. This is perhaps the most important thing, I think, in design. It's one reason why design has got to get off the post-it. Yeah? is we think we can recognize a good idea, but we can't. Now, if you read Kahneman on this, there is a slight proviso to this. If an idea is genuinely new, nobody can tell you if it's going to work or not. Nobody on this planet. So all those boards of experts, forget it. Yeah? All those idea competitions, forget them. If the idea is genuinely new, no human being can tell you if it's going to work or not. So we as facilitators have got to tell people, you don't understand the problem, your ideas are shit, 
And if a good idea comes along here, you're not going to recognize it. Now, that's a pretty hard situation to put somebody into. To hear those things is very, very difficult for somebody who values their expertise, their experience, and so on. Yeah? So how can we help people to work together? And one thing that's very important to me here is that I'm talking about all the different activities which are design. Research activities, we saw some researchers out there. Ideations, that's idea generation and selection activities, or pre-selection is a better word. Prototyping and implementation. For me, service design must include implementation, otherwise it will never be taken seriously. Yeah? And that's just the overview. If we zoom in, looking at hundreds of different methods, these are just the 53 methods that we have in the book. There are many, many other ones around this. So we're facilitating all these things in all these different activities for all different kinds of people. And by the way, if you're wondering again, why implementation on there, what, what's going on? This isn't workshop stuff. This may be a truth bomb for you, but I hope you can swallow it. Most facilitation takes place outside workshops. And the reason that most facilitation takes place out workshops is because most design takes place outside of workshops. If we as an industry of service designers, UX designers, whatever we are, want to be taken seriously, we have got to stop talking about workshops and we have got to start talking about projects and systems that we are designing. Yeah. Now that's not the workshops are not important, but you have a, have a scale of moments, yeah, a scale of context, if you like. We have the moment, the facilitation moment, and that's part of a workshop. But that workshop is part of a project, and that project is part of a culture. Yeah? And the important thing to remember as a facilitator is you're always facilitating the layers above. So when you are facilitating a moment, a difficult situation, for example, in a conversation, that's part of a workshop. Facilitating that moment is facilitating the workshop. And if you're facilitating a workshop, that workshop is part of a project. You must see it in that context. And that project is part of the organizational or cultural change. So you're always facilitating at least one level above what you're doing. Hold that thought, please. And now we come to the meat of my presentation because I promised you the three most important tools. We're back at the falls again, and this is where I go. The three most important tools of a facilitator. Other tools are available, and this is what they are. Now, these are sliders. Yeah, they're things that you push up or you push down. You give more of it or you give less of it. You go high or you go low. Yeah. Um, so think of these as sliders, not as on-offs. And the first one that I want to talk to you guys about is time. Time, I think, is one of the three most important tools of a facilitation. Because whether you're talking about a project level or a workshop level or a moment level or a tool level, whatever you're talking about, you always have a choice of how much time to give the group or the person to do that. Yeah. And the important connection here is that time gives, leads to depth. The more time people have to do something, the deeper they will go into it. And that can be useful at times when you want to get depth. But also, the deeper they go into something, the more attached they get to it. And the harder they find it to let go. And letting go is, for me, the most important skill that someone who's taking part in a design team can have, letting go of things. Yeah. So the more time I give you for something, the more attached you are to it. But if we are designing, we need to let go of things. So this slider of how much time to give is very, very important. Now, I talked about the Global Service Jam before and how people managed to create 700 new prototypes in 48 hours. And the reason they're doing that is because they have an impossible deadline. We're saying, we want you to change the world in 48 hours. And because that's ridiculous, because it's stupid, you know, it actually enables you to do it because nobody expects quality. We just expect you to get something out, that shitty first draft that we talked about before. So time, I think, is the first tool. The second one 
is space. It sounds a bit like a Star Trek episode here. I understand that, or Doctor Who maybe. Yeah. But in terms of space, I mean the physical context in which, or digital context in which you're facilitating and all the tools that people have. The continuum here is that space gives agency. Yeah. If I am physically unable to reach the whiteboard, it's very hard for me to take part in a conversation which happens around what's happening on that whiteboard. That's just simple. If I can't get past the digital hurdles that I have to take part in a collaborative project and I don't understand Basecamp or Monday or whatever, then I cannot contribute to that project. And the kind of agency I have will influence the, the form of collaboration that I can enter into. Yeah? So the physical spaces and digital spaces we're working in are actually directly impinging the collaboration forms you have in a workshop. It makes a difference how many pens you hand out. And it makes a difference if those pens are all the same or if some of them are weaker colors and some are stronger colors. That makes a huge difference to the collaboration. It makes a difference what color post-its you give people. Here's an example. This is from the book, This is Service Design Doing. Um, and this is some observations that I've made in my work over the last sort of 30 years as a facilitator. Yeah. Now, these are collaboration models, and they depend on the physicality of space. They work in digital contexts and in physical contexts. Yeah. And the first one is the common one. Usually, if you see a group of people working together, this is the way they work. Yeah. I call this one pen, one page. And this means they could be around a whiteboard or around a Google Doc they're all working on or a shared drive or whatever, or around a recipe, a, a bit of pot of paella, they're all cooking paella together. And there's usually several people talking and one person writing or typing or adding the ingredients or whatever. Yeah, I call this one pen, one page. And that person, by the way, in a mixed gender group, that person in a physical context is nearly always a woman. Yeah. She has a choice, I think, if she's going to be a slave of the group or an empress of the group. Because she can say, what should I write? Or she can say, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Hmm. And then decide what to write. But anyway, the point is, with this thing, what appears on that paper, there's kind of a consensus around it. We all get it. It all goes through one pen. We all see it being written. We all kind of compromised around it, but we kind of agree with that thing. What if, what if everybody gets a pen? By the way, the book, which I mentioned before, this is services I'm doing was written mostly in this way. All of us typing simultaneously into a shared online document. So now everyone gets a pen. They're all able to reach the table or reach the paper or access the drive. And they all write into it at the same time. I've got less consensus now and more co-creation. Because if we're cooking together, if, for example, Christopher, Christopher Roberts and I are cooking together, yeah? And Christopher says, Adam, it needs more salt. And Adam says, Christopher, I believe it has enough salt. And Christopher says, Adam, it needs more salt. And I say, Christopher, I believe it has enough salt. And Christopher then takes the salt and goes, do, 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 do. What am I going to do? I have to accept and build on that. I can't retroactively uh, undo that thing. So it's now no longer co uh, consensus, it's more co-creation. Or what if we all split up? So what if everyone gets their own pen and their own paper and we go away and work furiously and we bring back what we've got and we put our work together? I hope you can see that the results of these three collaboration patterns, which depend almost entirely on physicality, are different. Consensus to co-creation to diversity. By the way, the many pens, many pages, although we get doubles and we still have to share, is still by far the fastest way to get work done, split groups up. So as a facilitator, you can use space, for example, table size, access to walls, access to Miro boards or mural boards or shared drives or Google Docs. You can use all those things to strongly influence the collaborative patterns and the results that you get. The third one is status. Now, I'm talking here not about your status in an organization, which is defined by your place in the organizational chart. I'm talking about your status in terms of relative status. 
Because if you put five CEOs in a room, there's still status within those CEOs because of, because of the way that they, they vibe, because of the way they stand, talk, listen, don't listen. Yeah? So it's relative status. And as a facilitator, one of our sliders is the difference between adopting low relative status and high relative status. Yeah? Do I appear like a servant or like a master or somewhere in between from moment to moment? Now, this again is quite a physical thing, so it's a little more subtle in digital context. But if you want to get a lesson in physical status, just go to the zoo. Yeah? Go and look at our cousins, for example, the baboons or any of the other primates. Yeah? And we can see here actually two quite high status animals. We have an alpha animal and a, a senior beta animal here. But in this context, they're playing relative high and low status to each other. So the high status animal who even has extra fur to emphasize his wide shoulders yeah, is taking up space. His elbows point out, his knees are spread. He's man spreading. Yeah? By the way, there is a load of gender shit in this, a load of gender shit in this. Um, he's man spreading, he's looking up, he's looking straight out. He's probably got quite a deep, quiet voice and doesn't say very much doesn't need to raise his voice because if you want to listen, you'll listen. And if you don't, well, yeah. So that's the high status and the relatively low status individual there, very tucked in, elbows in, knees in, eyes down, hands to small. Yeah? Doesn't want to occupy too much space. The classical servant pose, if you like. You imagine the servant with their feet together, their hands behind them, or even their hands folded in front of them. These are all classic things that you can do. And the important thing to say here is that high status does not mean you're in charge and low status does not mean you're not in charge. Status and control are not the same thing. It is very possible to control a situation from low status. You see that every time you go into a restaurant, a really good restaurant, and the waiter says, ah, welcome, madam, welcome. Please come on over, please, this way. Your table is here, ready for you. Please, I hope you like this table, it's the best one. That, that waiter is totally in charge of your ass. Yeah? And they're playing low status to, to command you. So if you're against a high status person in a situation, in a workshop, you can try and go high. They're probably naturally very good at that. Or you can go low and still lead them. And this is why this joker was so important to me. Because a joker in a pack of cards can change its status. It can be an ace, a king, a queen. It can be a two, a three, a four. And we as facilitators need to be that. In fact, one of the most important models of facilitation is by a Brazilian guy called Boal, Augusto Boal. And he calls the facilitator in his work the joker because that's what you do. You have that, that role of maybe using humor, but also of changing to be very dominant or very servile. And all the time, a servant master, a master servant, servant leadership, moving the process to where it needs to be. Talking quite a long time now, I want to just bring this to an end really quickly. Then I'm gonna open up for some questions and some other stuff, but really quickly to summarize, I consider these to be your three sliders, your three main tools as a facilitator. There's time, how much of it you give and how you give it, yeah? Space, how you use the physicality of your digital or physical working space, who gets a pen, who doesn't get a pen, who gets access to the workspace, who doesn't? And status, how you play your variable status as a facilitator to match, to mirror, to go over or to go under people, to, to contrast them or to match them, to help move the, the thing along. And you also, uh, Mark asked me a question. I want to finish up in the last two minutes by answering Mark's question and we can go to open, open space, I think, yeah. Um, how do you create safe space in a context? Now, Safe space is a term which comes from theater. And my background, as I said, is being psychology, motorcycle development, and theater. That's where I come from. And in theater, we talk about safe space. I can go into a rehearsal room in any theater anywhere around the world, 
yeah? And I will see probably black curtains, a black painted wooden floor, some broken furniture, and the worst coffee in the world, yeah? And I will know this is a rehearsal room. I can do whatever I want here. I decide what comes out of this room. In this room, in this room, mistakes are expected and mistakes are welcome. Now, that's the opposite of most organizations. In most organizations, if you make a mistake, there's a meeting. Yeah? And that is not what we need in design. So creating the context, the physical and mental space in which it's okay to make mistakes is super important. So it's about, first of all, get the right people in the project. Yeah? Most facilitation does not play, take place in the workshop. So make sure we have people in here who are going to use this, people are going to run this, people are going to pay for this, and people who can stop this. Those four types of people need to be in the room, and they need to know why it's relevant for them to be in the room. This needs to be directly linked to their goals and their jobs. Otherwise, forget it. Yeah. Start conservative. Wear a suit. I'm not joking. I wear a suit every day at work. I freaking hate it. Yeah? But if I'm going to go in there dressed like a student, I'm going to get paid like a student. And I'm going to get treated like a student. So adjust to the context that you're in. But generally speaking, you should be dressing like the senior management of the organization you're working for because you're ordering people around. By the way, a waiter also wears a suit. Think about that. A contract. Now, when a session kicks off, one of the first things I normally do is I ask people, okay, we have this project together now, or we have this day together now. Let's say it's a day. Yeah? What needs to happen today for today to be successful for you? And write down the things that they need, they need to happen. And then be honest and say, this is not on scope. That we can't do. This we can try. That we're definitely going to do. Yeah. And then after that, you can say, okay, um, what do I need? How do you need to be to do that? And how do I need to be to support you in doing that? And that is your contract. And later on, you can say, well, I'm keeping my part. Are you keeping your part? Write these things down. Co-own the space. Let people move things around. When you run a Zoom meeting, make everybody co-host so they can jump between rooms themselves. Trust them with that. That makes them own, own the thing. Use impossible deadlines and liquid time. Give them as much time as you think they need, then change it. Give them less or more if they're almost finished, shorten the time. If they need more time, give them more time. Keep your eye on the end time, but keep it moving. Promote those shitty first drafts. Let them do things which are rough. And part of that means when someone is doing something for the first time, don't put a spotlight on them. Let people do things on their own first or simultaneously so nobody is watching them. And this is the final one. This is my, if you like, my message to your facilitators. As a facilitator, we own the context. We do not own the outcome. I take absolutely no responsibility for the outcome of my workshops being successful. That is entirely the responsibility of the participants. I will do everything I can to give them the perfect environment for that to happen. That's my responsibility, but I cannot do the work for them. I'm a facilitator, I am not a co-worker. We call this freedom within structure. Yeah? I know the time I think is getting very, very short, so I want to open up to a, a more casual open session. Three things for you guys to look for. One is the Global Service Jam I recommend to you guys. One is the Applied Improvisation Network, and one is the Co-Creation School, yeah, where I prototype lots of this stuff, and you're welcome to join us. Greg. How are we doing for time? Should we open it up there? We will need to leave now. How are we doing? Or oh, Brandon, sorry. Yeah, I think we can. I think we can have some questions through chat. We haven't really kept track of it. So if you have a specific mm -hmm. question for Adam, if you don't mind just running it now in the chat room, we can. Uh, I mean, you can read them as well. So, so I see one from Zelda already. Yeah, and from about how the facilitator manages status. Yeah. So we're talking here about relative status. Don't forget. Uh, and by the way, the fact that there you have a relative status and an absolute status, which is your position in the organization chart, um, this makes it quite difficult for somebody from inside a team to facilitate that team. 
and it makes it almost impossible for a team leader to facilitate. That's just a bad idea, don't do it. If you're a team leader, do not facilitate. Yeah? But if you are not the team leader, if you have a flexible, a degree of flexible status, you can modify your status by the way you behave. So it might be by standing up. It might be by moving closer to make yourself look bigger. It might be by hmm, going down. It might be by, you can lower your status, for example, by not finishing a sentence, by asking lots of questions with a higher voice. Yeah, you become relatively low status. Or if you are larger, I said lots of gender in this, yeah. If you are larger with a deeper voice, you can ask a very, a, use a very few words and say, right, what now? That's relatively high status. And you can play and bounce off the status of other people to reflect what they're doing or to go under or over it. There's a question there. How do you approach teams, for example, highly technical who do not want to pick up a pen? A couple of answers already in my thing, I think. Uh, first of all, they should know why they're in the room. They should know why it's relevant to their job before they show up because then it's, it's clearly their job. You can contract with them in advance to say, okay, how do you need to be to reach these goals? Nothing, I need to be proactive, I need to get stuck in and so on. And if they won't pick up a pen, you say, well, are you keeping your side of the contract? Did I keep my side of the contract? So what's going on? Another thing is, do you really need tables? Do you need chairs? Because if you're standing up, it's actually easier if you're holding a pen, you'll feel safer. So work on a whiteboard, no tables, no chairs, and you'll find that problem tends to go away. Peter asks, many people have that one person does not want to be there and thinks workshops are bullshit. Workshops are bullshit. We need to stop talking about workshops. This is a project. This is part of that movement within our company. This is sponsored by that C-suite member. It's part of that strategic plan. This is part of your so-and-so achievement goals. Yeah, and this workshop is a small part of that. So it's very hard to think projects are bullshit. And a good approach to get him on your side is, well, is this thing relevant to him? And if it's relevant to him, he should be on your side. If he's not relevant to him, talk to him and find out why he's here. And if he says, well, I was sent to be here, let him go. Send him home. Say, it's not useful for you. It's not useful for anybody else. Go home or go back to work. Do something useful. And I will clear that with your boss because it, it wasn't made clear to you why you were coming today. And I'm sorry about that. Yeah, but have a conversation around that with the person. So I'd like to, there's a lot of questions here. Uh, by the way, you can see um, on the screen on the one side is my Twitter handle, Adam St. John. You can find me through the barcode on LinkedIn and so on. Yeah, I'll take that screen, that slide off screen in a second so, you can, so we can see each other. Let me switch the microphones on. Yeah, um, I'm happy to take questions through Twitter, through through LinkedIn or whatever, or just, you know, just contact me. Um, there's a couple of questions here about, about remote, about remote facilitation. What are some ways, Carrie Peterson says, that we can maintain these tools within a remote space? I think everything still applies in a remote space, um, but it's more subtle, yeah? So you still can be relatively high status or low status. So I'm wearing a shirt today. Trust me, I've been in a t-shirt all day. I put on a shirt for this call, yeah? I'm wearing nothing from the waist down. But, uh, <laughs> Actually, I am, but I'm dressed more comfortably from the waist down. It doesn't matter. But I think, yes, these things apply in a professional context. I've chosen to show my background. That's a cultural thing. Um, Zoom backgrounds can make you look very serious or very abstract behind you. Um, but think about the staging. Yeah? I spend quite a lot of money on lighting for my calls. Yeah? I can adjust the lighting and put it up and down and so on. Um, I've got a standing desk. Yeah? So I really can move around. So I can use physicality more than I would like to otherwise. So I think you can transfer lots of this, especially around sharing the space, about having co-creative situations where we're all working in a Miro. This for so many people, it's very, very hard to do that today. But we could have all worked on a Miro board, it would have broken down yeah, with 300 people. 
Um, but if that's possible, that's much better than lecturing people. Uh, if that make them co-host, so they can move between rooms themselves and have different breakout rooms. They can freely move between them. That's a much more, a much different situation than being assigned to a room all the time. So share responsibility. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so I can see more of your beautiful faces. Please go ahead and put your camera on if you're still there. Fantastic. Should we put our mics on as well so we can talk to each other? How does that sound? Go ahead and put your mic on if you like. You're, very, you're a brave soul. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> well, yeah, everybody should be able to unmute yourself. Um, if you're having trouble turning your camera on, just ping me and I can, I can fix that for you. Uh, okay, Janine, I'm on it. So while you guys are thinking what you might want to ask, uh, there's a question from Hilary uh, Esreg I'd like to address. Um, if most facilitation takes place outside of workshops and as a result takes place when we may not be involved with consultants, what can we do to facilitate the organization's process during the non-workshop time? Well, don't just sell workshops. If you can sell coaching as well. Sell, sell office time, sell check-ins. Uh, sell, um, I forget the English word, work alongs, so you're working beside somebody. Um, develop an ally within the organization who is your co facilitator in the formats where you are there and is the lead facilitator when you're not there. Uh, but really, you shouldn't be away from it for too long if you're taking it seriously. Yeah, unless you have a brief to come in for a very, very concise thing like a sprint or something in which case it's fine then you talk to them before the session what happens to the outputs so you can be truthful to people during the session as well have you had any success this is hillary have hi you hillary. hi i know something that i'm sure a lot of you have done and heard advocated is you print out you know giant visual outputs or you make a wall within um of what you've decided and how ideally facilitate um the team to rally around it. Have you mm. had any success with that sort of thing? So you're sort of keeping that workshop or that collaboration and, and this changes in remote, but it, it could, I think be done. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. On that? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think one of the most important things which has to be woven through the entire collaboration is the question of what happens after this particular section yeah after this sprint after this workshop after this project phase what happens next and how are we setting up what happens after that so are the people who are going to be involved in continuing it are they in the room now and if not get them here now we need them otherwise this is pointless yeah um well how can we bring them in if their time is very valuable in some in some useful way and collaborate with them the people who are going to own the next stage on what they need to come out of it and then certainly physicalize that. So I don't tend to print things out. Um, I tend to let things happen within the workshop. And if they're handwritten, you can always use whatever format emerges. Yeah. But some people feel good if it's printed out. So it looks real. It's like money's been spent, you know. And they say budget is how organizations show their love. So yeah. if it looks like this is on fancy, this was a mistake I made at the beginning. I like to use flip charts and so on. And I was really pushing one of our clients to use flip charts and post-its mm -hmm. and everything handwritten. And they were saying, and I said, look, there's free templates online. Why are you spending hundreds, tens of thousands of euros doing graphic design for your own templates where you can go and get the thing from Canvanizer or get it from, from um, Strategizer or something like this. And they said, Adam, because if it hasn't got our logo on it, people won't think it's real. Mm, interesting. They were completely right. I was wrong. They were completely right. It needed to have that. It needed to have every PowerPoint slide branded. Otherwise, you were just the next trainer, the next consultant who came through. You need to look like them and smell like them. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. This is Matt. Um, how do you practice your facilitation until you gain the trust to actually do it? Uh, you don't. <laughs> you, just, you, you just try. Uh, and I think... You see me leaning forward and coming in on camera is me going low status now, yeah? Um, this is, I think when you are starting off with this stuff, I said start conservatively, yeah? And I'm quite lucky I can get people's permission to do stuff because I can show them the book or I can, you know, say I'm a professor here or whatever, yeah? Um, or, or expert there. I, I have that, and I'm a white guy. I'm a white guy as well, that helps enormously. Um, but, uh, if you're not, if you are new, I don't think there's anything wrong with being transparent about that and saying, this is, this is a thing which I've seen. 
Uh, it was done here. It was really awesome. Um, would you help me to see if it works for us? You know, that kind of honesty, I think, can, be, can work. I've seen people do exquisite work leading workshops from very low status using that kind of method. You know, they were young. They were inexperienced. Um, I saw this especially in China where people are very, very aware of status and they can use it exquisitely, uh, for, at least for my eyes as an outsider. Um, and just being transparent about that and say, well, you know, what, what do you need for this to be a success? This is what I need. Where does this overlap? And then you've got to make your mistakes, you know, so which is, which is why I recommend things like jamming and so on, because it gives you a chance to, to try this in a safe environment where if you mess it up, you know, so oh, it was a jam, nobody died. You know, um, it was just a, just a fun evening. It was a service design network event. It was a local meetup. It was a service design drinks. These contexts let you try things out. Patrick's waving like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, as you were saying that uh, we don't have to say uh, of calling them workshops and uh, more projects. So uh, facilitating is, is is there where it happens, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, uh, in your opinion, the difference between coaching and facilitating? Oh, this is one that I can geek out on for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> I once sat down with a coaching friend and we tried to draw a matrix and it got really complicated uh, around coaching and facilitating and managing and uh, uh, all these kind of things. I think mostly when the word coaching is used, your focus is on bringing the person or the team forward. Yeah. So this person or this team wants to develop and you may do project coaching may have quite a strong focus on making the team better or the person better and facilitation is also part of that balance, yeah? But it's a balance which is shifted towards getting the project done, getting the outputs built, and so on. So that's a very short answer to a very complicated question. Uh, I think super useful thing to use here is something like clean language. Um, so generally, I'm trying to develop, uh, this is, a, I got this from a guy called Olaf Lewitz, by the way, a really smart guy, I'll type that in the, in the uh, chat. You should look out for his work. Um, Olaf Leavitz. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, can't spell like that. Um, and he's not the original of this, but he taught it to me. The thing with clean language, which basically some a very a very short way of saying it is when someone says to you service design, blah 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 blah, say to them, okay, when you say service design, what do you mean? Yeah? When someone says coaching, it's okay, so when you say coaching, what does that look like? When you say facilitation, what does that mean for you? When you say project, what does that mean for you? Yeah. But to take these words that we all assume that we mean, but have a huge range of meanings and try and ask somebody to get specific about what that, what that looks like, not in terms of using other words to describe it, but actually paint you some pictures with language or even with a pen. Nick had one. Sorry, somebody else was waving. I heard somebody waving. I heard, I heard somebody waiting. No. Yeah, John. Do you have any uh, unique tips for facilitating in a one-on-one -on -one situation? It's, that scares the life out of me. Um, because well, that also depends on my, on my concept of facilitation and my, um, the methods that I come, come from theater, which tends to be a one-to-many or a small amount-to-many context yeah so i'm used to facilitating quite large groups i do jams with 800 people or a thousand people in the room sometimes um but i think if you are going to be facilitating one-on-one -on -one, and if it's not coaching so it's about the project not about the person yeah first of all clarify that in advance how much of it is this how much of it is that and secondly give lots of space step away a lot otherwise it gets super intensive and even a bit creepy um, and you get sucked into doing the work yourself, which I think is not the point of facilitation. It's a bit like maybe that chess game where you get the master in the middle of the room and she's playing against eight opponents at once and she turns and does a bit here and a bit here and a bit there. Maybe you can do something like that with multiple people to give you also a reason to go away. Thank you. Thank you. Mia wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. Hi there. 
Um, hi, Mia. Well, hi there. I did a, a workshop this afternoon and it was a real discovery right at the beginning of a project, you know, wanted to get people's feelings. And um, I was badgered for the last few days saying, right, can we have an agenda? Can we have a structure and everything? And I got so irritated with that. I, I found a workshop that I did a few weeks ago and I just changed the titles and just sent it to them. And I said, but I may not use these slides. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I did it, I didn't because I was listening to find out what they had to say and reacting to that and everything. But I, I will admit there were a couple of times when I wobbled, when I had yeah. all these cheeky little faces looking at me to, you know, think of the next thing to say to sort of like move it along and keep it fluid. So what advice would you give around that? Yeah, I use fake agendas a lot. Um, so, well, they're not... Huh. They're not actually fake, but they're fake. You know what I mean? They, they, they're not lying, but they're deceptive. Um, so if lying is the intent to deceive, I'm, I'm guilty. So here's the thing. If you're going to send people out in to do, to do street research at 9.30 in the morning of the first day, you probably shouldn't write that on the agenda because lots of them will suddenly have reasons so they can't come to lunchtime. Yeah? But if you put 9.30, customer insights, all right, yeah? They'll show up and, and street research is customer insights. It's just not, not a PowerPoint presentation that you expected. Yeah. So I think using what I will tend to do is I will tend to do agendas which are quite chunky. So I try and put in the breaks because people need to use the breaks to make phone calls and, you know, um, check in with colleagues or childcare, whatever. Yeah. I'm absolutely anal about start and finish time. I mean, to the minute, yeah? I mean, Colin's been in some of the workshops, some others of you here as well have, and you know, if we say it's five o'clock, that means five o'clock, I'm either finishing or apologizing and asking if we can go on another minute or two. Um, because people need that, they need to know when they can go and so on. But in terms of what's happening in the big chunks, they're often quite vague descriptions which sort of f fulfill people's needs for a sense of progress, yeah? Um, but then I'm, I'm deciding in the flow what I do in that moment or often co-deciding because I nearly always facilitate with two or three colleagues, I'm sorry, with one or two colleagues, with teams of one, two or three nearly all the time, which is wonderful. It's a luxury, uh, but it's a wonderful luxury. It makes everything so much easier. And then in terms of um, what we're actually doing, we are probably um, running a mix of, of activities. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share another Another slide with you guys, I didn't use it today. Uh, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? Da, da, da. So it's important to have a mix of different things that you're doing in the workshop because some people like to be reflective, some people like to be, um, oops, excuse me, unskip slide. I was gonna share my screen again. So this is, this is the model I use of, uh, of co-creation. You have some activity, which could be research or prototyping. That gives you data. Uh, that gives you insights. That gives you ideas. And you have your activity. Yeah? And you're going around and around this. Order. You can start anywhere. You can jump between things. Yeah? That's the basic model I use for design or innovation or whatever. And it's important to remember that there are people who are very strong in each of these things. Yeah? There are people who are very strong. Let's get up and do something. That's their preference. Some people like to ah, observe. Oh, see that? Oh, look at this. Oh, that was really interesting. Did you notice that detail here? Other people connect things together. Ah, that means that. Oh, that means that. That changes our theory completely. And other people say, well, if that's our new theory, the next thing we should do is this. Come on, let's get it on the road. And then someone steps up and says, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Let's do it. Yeah? So if you try and move through this on a micro level as well as a macro level, yeah, then you will engage the different types of people. Um, and most importantly, you won't leave them disengaged for too long because they're always suffering when, it, when the opposite thing is happening. They're suffering, yeah? So that's a, that's a model that I use for that. I'll put that in the PDF I stand around so you can see it. I believe Giovanni was asking uh, Giovanni from Germany. So yeah, this, this sounds like a really good question. What are the major challenges for facilitating in a language that is not your mother tongue? Have you ever done that? Well, Vanny and I both, both do this quite a lot. Anybody else do that? Anybody else facilitate in more than one language or in a foreign language? 
Yeah, Greg, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Brandon, yeah. A few of us. Um, so I think you can all answer as much as me. I, I mean, I feel that in German, which I'm pretty good at. So it's not really a big difference for me anymore. Um, I facilitate in French and my French is appalling. So uh, that is really a struggle. <laughs> I mean, Vanny, you, you, what, do you, what have you learned so far? Vanny, Giovanni, what have you learned so far? He's muted. Yep, you're unmuted now. Yeah, come from a lower status. They're not. They're not foreign. I think you have to come from a lower status there. You've almost got no choice. You know, Vanny's having some sound. He's got some you know, sound problems, I think. So one thing I've noticed is, you, is again, it becomes a co-responsibility. One of the most exciting things that I do is I facilitate in English and Chinese. And I speak no Chinese at all. Um, so we have two English language facilitators and two facilitators who speak English and Chinese, the Mandarin Chinese, and we have a bunch of people in the workshop who speak either English or Chinese or both. Yeah. So there's, there are, there are mono linguists in both, in both languages. And we make that part of the, as Rosemary says, yeah, we make it part of the task. Yeah. Part of the task of this is to understand that we're all in this together and we all have co-creation uh, responsibilities the language as well so one very simple thing that we do is this groups around 20 people or so yeah with again, mixed languages in them so we will all stick our post-its in whatever language you're coming so I, i'm sticking post-its in english my chinese colleague is sticking it in chinese yeah and then we we have a symbol which is you know, it's a non-language symbol for the bees busy bees which kind of means the same thing in both cultures and then we all swarm over these post-its. And if you speak both languages, you're writing the other language and on the post-it. So if you see Chinese, you'll write English below it. If you see English, you'll write Chinese below it. And then we can step back again and we can say, oh, now everyone can sort post-its. Now everyone can move them around because we all understand the post-its now. And we use simultaneous translation on the verbal channel. We don't need that on the paper channel because we can see it. And that takes about two minutes. It's super quick. And it's part of that symbol you're setting that everyone is responsible, that everybody else is engaged. I'm back in the meantime. Sorry. Yeah. For not being so able what to have been your experiences around, around, uh, well, I have, I have a genetic advantage being Italian. I can move a lot of my hands and this is absolutely <laughs> healthy. Uh, by the way, even different, um, uh, body language is not always having the same meaning in different cultures, but, um, yeah. what I try is always to add a little bit more structure in the communication, not overloading. I don't, bring in so so uh how can i say uh, explanation or heavy explanation but definitely i like to have some structure so that people can refer to to um mm. what i'm trying to say mm. yeah that's i think that's another thing i mean if you know this language struggles in the room you know be wary of people's individual struggles be aware of them sorry and you might do things like make sure the instructions are also always shown on a screen you know even if it's not in every language, at least it's there. It's easier to read than hear sometimes, or both is always good. Yeah. So also the larger the group you have, make sure. It's, I always say that every 20 more people a group gets, it reduces the group IQ by five. Yeah. So if you've got like 30 people, that's a normal IQ. If you've got 50, mm, yeah, if you've got 100, mm, we're getting, if you've got 500, it's really, really tricky. If you've got 5,000, it's a beast. Yeah? It's, a, it's, it's an amoeba. Yeah? So with larger groups, you might want to make sure you're always having a handout with the instructions on it, which is lying on every table, or you have video screens all around the place saying, your task is use this template, use this many pens, your time is, and so on. Now, that, of course, requires you to prepare more carefully and to be quite rigid with your preparation. Um, unless you're going into during the previous session to change your timing and so on like that. That can be helpful as well. Adam, we're going to have to wrap it up because we're back three sure. minutes from 1.30. Um, what is the one tip you would give all the attendees to, is that like a book to become a better facilitator, a video, a movie? And what is the one thing? And I think we're probably going to have to have you again because obviously we have a ton of questions and you just basically sure, just sure. Skim, skim through the top. But like, give us some homework. 
Okay, so the homework would be two communities, which I mentioned before. Uh, one was the Global Jam community. So check that out, globaljams.org, globaljams.org. Uh, and the other one is to, to try stuff and learn stuff and to really change your perspective of a, as a facilitator is the applied improvisation dot network, applied improvisation dot network. They're both global communities. So wherever you are in the world, you'll find practitioners in both of those. They overlap strongly as well. So you'll see people who are happy in both communities. And my tip to you is the audience will, this is a theater saying, yeah, the audience will forgive you everything until you embarrass them. The audience will forgive you everything until you embarrass them. And one of the easy ways to embarrass people is to by pretending to be something that you're not. So when you're looking at all these great facilitators in the world, and I look at many people who really strongly inspire me here, don't try to be them because it won't work. They can't be you and you can't be them. So find a way to do this whereby you can be yourself and make your mistakes and learn from them and be transparent around that. But always be yourself because if you are yourself, you are authentic. And if you are authentic, you are always engaging. That's a great tip. Um, I think we're going to, have to wrap it up because people have to go and get some work done. So obviously, thank you so much, Adam, for you know, taking time. I know it's Thanks very late for you. Uh, and I know you're over 50 now, so it's, it's difficult for you to stay up after seven o'clock. Um, <laughs> it's, it's true it's true it's true, it's true. um we, we definitely need to do this again i mean there is so much to talk about now you and i we, we met a couple of years ago in new york and you can do this for like literally three days straight so um let's plan on doing this again over the summer probably sure. um and then um if you have any question please let us know through you know the chat the video of this recording will be available tonight most likely in the evening here in the u.s uh, on the YouTube, so look on the YouTube channel. Um, and thank you so much, Adam. I, I love having you, and I wish we could do this in person, and maybe one day we'll just do, we get to fly you over here and have some fun in person. But Adam is wonderful. I can't, I can't speak enough of how incredible he is. Um, and thank you for everybody. So we have over 100 people that join us uh, from all over the world, so thank you so much all of you guys. Uh, as a quick reminder before we uh, stop this, I want to remind you that uh, we will have on the second, Jim is going to talk about mapping experiences. On the ninth, Mark is going to talk more about education and portfolio. On the 25th of June, we have Andy is going to talk about the business of service design. And of course, on the 30th, so we have a very heavy agenda and kind of like taking advantage, you know, in a guilty way of this COVID-19, you know, lockdown. We actually can do a lot of that stuff now. Uh, we have Jesse is going to talk to us about innovation in the startup environment on the 30th. Um, I think that's that's about it. Anybody wants to have any more last minute talk? Brendan? Robin? Are you All gonna right. close down the room or are you gonna let people hang out? Is that possible? I, I have no idea if we have a I, I have to close down the room. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So sorry about that. But bye everyone. Check out our YouTube channel. And, okay. Uh, See you on the channel. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye Zoom wave. Zoom, Zoom applause. Yeah, Zoom Bye. wave. Zoom applause. Bye. Zoom applause. Bye. 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 Bye